It's time to introduce the second of our speakers today, Sister Marianne Confroy, RSC. She initially completed a Bachelor of Arts in Melbourne, postgraduate studies at Boston College and Harvard Graduate School of Education, and a PhD in Theology and Education from Boston College. She's a Professor of Practical Theology at the Jesuit Theological College and a past president of the United Faculty of Theology in Melbourne, Australia. She's a visiting professor at the Institute of Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry at Boston College in the United States, and she has been a very influential uh, figure, I guess, in furthering study of spirituality here in Australia and further afield. She's with us through this presentation to talk to us on a couple of different levels, and first up, to look at the baptismal call to holiness. We welcome now Sister Marianne Confoy. Thanks, Mark. And thanks to you, Broken Bay Institute, and especially to Bishop Michael for that speech talk we've just had. And just recently, Ladislaus Orsi, a special expert at Vatican II, when asked about his understanding at this stage of Vatican II, said it was as if a tsunami of the Holy Spirit had swamped us and washed away all the documents that had previously been pre prepared by the Curia, and new understandings were opened up for everybody. So Vatican II is truly an event of grace, an event brought about not just by John Paul II, John XXIII, um, but also by the Holy Spirit who guides the church now, then and always. The baptismal call to holiness is a call to personal and communal ministry. And we've moved from a dualistic understanding of ministry that had prevailed. Previously, the subject of ministry was the ordained and the object of ministry was the non-ordained. So we now have, over the decades following Vatican II, new models, circles of ministry, rather than a hierarchical structure, is what many of us understand in response to the call to holiness. New images, a pilgrim church, a people of God. And this calls us to a service which is across our differences. Vatican II makes a claim on us all, no matter how we personally and communally receive it, our age, our chosen way of living, our baptismal commitment, or in what location even we're living. Any one of those 12 countries that are watching us now. As we struggle to respond to Vatican II, receptivity is the issue. Now is the moment, and we need to recognise that our own open-ended response is what is being called for, and this is going to open us up to new life, new growth, and a new understanding of discipleship. Vatican II called us to an understanding of ministry as a threefold call. It's prophetic, calling us to witness, enabling us to be healing in our church. Priestly, making holy, that coming to understand the holiness in the ordinary as well as the extraordinary parts of our lives. Kingly, we are all called to leadership through baptism. And after the council, the expert Eve Congar expressed a concern that the call that the Vatican offered would not be heard. And he said, too many Catholics do not have a backbone, so they try to find a shell to hide behind. Some hide behind the shelter of authority, externalised so that they're not responsible. And some behind a paternalism that stifled both personal and communal responsibility. However, in the decades that have followed Vatican II, in the tapestry that Bishop Michael described, we can see the response of many people in various areas to the call 
to centre their mission, their ministry, on, in and through the mission of Jesus. And in this, the mission of the church has been enriched. And we have all exercised our diverse gifts, both in church and society. We're all called to ecclesial ministry. It's not only through the sacraments and the ministries of the church that the Holy Spirit makes holy and leads the people of God and enriches it with virtues, but, and I'm quoting from Lumen Gentium 12, allotting his gifts to everyone according as he wills, God distributes special graces among the faithful of every rank. By these gifts, the Spirit makes them fit and ready to undertake the various tasks and offices which contribute toward the renewal and building up of the church. So it's, as Bishop Michael said, the dogmatic constitution on the church, the light of nations, that we have the foundation for ministry. Through baptism and confirmation, we are gifted to live our commitment and calling with faith, with hope, and with love, ever renewed. And we do this in our own unique gifts of living our everyday lives with a sense of purpose. And in that, we find that the call to holiness is the call to wholeness, to be whole people. To live authentically opens us up to our limits as well as to our strengths. It is easier to withdraw from responsibility than to take our lives seriously. It takes great courage to face the things that surface in us as we work for God's reign, both now and not yet. We're called to do things that we don't like to do sometimes, to find out things that we don't always like about ourselves and rather, would rather not know. That's the cost of discipleship. And God's promise always, recounted in Lumen Gentium 12, is, promises us special graces that will be given to see us through, both personally and as the community of the church. The prophetic ministry is particular. It always takes shape in a particular cultural context. The Hebrew prophets were open to and drawn by the call of the Holy Spirit. They had a dangerous public religious function and their role was to read the signs of the times and to remind people of their covenantal obligations in love and in freedom. Now this prophetic call is considered by many to be the most important. We're called in baptism and in confirmation to prophetic witness in our own time and in our own cultural context, in the here and now. To look for the signs of the times that are calling us to new and diverse forms of ministry and to work with our sisters and brothers in Christ as witnesses to God's saving work in our particular time and our particular situation. The prophetic witness doesn't necessarily mean that we will talk about our commitment in, to Christ or his saving mission in our daily routine. What it does actually mean is that as family, friends, co-workers, in our conversation with them, with each other, as they see us struggling to make meaning out of situations that seem to be void of meaning, as they see us struggling to live with purpose, as they see us facing some raw situ situ human sufferings, our struggles, our steadfast courage to keep going, and our continued belief in goodness and the value of life. In that, they will see the living Christ in us and in our communities. We are 
the face, the presence of Christ. That is our call. And in order to live this prophetic call, we need to be a priestly people. We need to nourish our lives with personal and communal prayer and practices. We need to be connected in and through our communities. The assurance of God's love is real in the priestly vocation. It's an assurance in which Jesus brought to people a means of healing, of bringing to the fullness of living and loving. So authentic holiness is found in being open to the invitation of the spirit of God's love in our everyday lives. It's a call to authenticity. It's not always the call that was expected. Remember the two tax collectors who met Jesus. Levi became Matthew, was called to be a disciple, one of the special 12. Zacchaeus, another tax collector, was called and he came to change his life, but he wasn't called to be a disciple. He was simply called to keep living his life in the faithfulness of its own trajectory. So each one of us has the call to the priestly ministry of living our yes to God in and through the lives of ordinary holiness, of connectedness to all people in the ways we experience that connectedness. And Gaudiumet spares the church in the modern world, an extraordinary Vatican II document, reminds us in the opening sentence that the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties, especially of those who are poor and afflicted, in any way, whatever, these are our griefs, our anxieties, our joys and our hopes. This is the call that we have, a call to grow in authenticity, a lifelong task, our living yes. And the third call is the call to king, the kingly call, the role of leader. Jesus clearly brought to the many people he met a consciousness of how life lived in its fullness is lived intentionally towards God and how the coming kingdom is a dimension of reality that is found in the midst of the everyday, the now and the not yet dimension. We are all called to the leadership ministry of Christ and we're all called to be followers as well. We both lead and follow in our ministry of service, which needs to be seen as visible, tangible service to others, care of others. Christians full of care. So whatever our calling may be, communally and societally, we attend to the different roles we are called to exercise. Care for, of and for others requires us to be aware of our own inner as well as our outer lives. We can't be living compartmentalised lives, operating on one level with one group of people, operating on another with another group of people. We need to come together. We're asked to live intentionally, to open our eyes and our hearts to what's happening around us, both locally and globally in our human community, and as people accountable for our environment, socially, politically, economically, ecologically, to live responsibly and to see how we can affect others in our own efforts to live as responsible people on our planet. 
To be people of the gospel, we need to be people of our world as it's mediated and Vatican II in the document on the church in the modern world's world calls us to pay attention to the way in which we mediate our understanding of the significance of life and to the way in which it's mediated to us. So we need to pay attention, to judge for ourselves what's happening to people, to the socially invisible, to act responsibly and wisely for the good of all people, the well-being of the whole church and reaching out to society because we have been entrusted with the saving ministry and mission of Jesus. We, the mission of church is the mission of Jesus. In virtue of its mission to enlighten the whole world with the message of the gospel and to gather together in one spirit all women and men of every nation, race and culture. The church shows itself as a sign of that amity, that friendship, which renders possible sincere dialogue and strengthens it. And we live our mission of the church in various ways, in various communities. And we struggle to be present, present to ourselves, present to the reality, the joys, the griefs, the anxieties, the hopes, so that there may be a future for others. Our call as the church in the modern world reminds us in number 92, is to create mutual esteem, reverence and harmony, and to acknowledge all other members of the faithful, to engage in ever more fruitful dialogue. And the ties which unite the faithful are stronger, we're reminded, than those which separate them. And it concludes with the comment, let there be unity in what is necessary, freedom in what is doubtful, and charity in everything. This is the mission which Jesus gave his church. It's our mission through the various emphases in all of the Vatican II documents. How do we create mutual esteem, reverence and harmony? And how do we acknowledge legitimate diversity? Various people have struggled to express this as they have gone through uh, their lives of the church and their commitment to the church. One of the problems that we face in talking about fruitful dialogue is that sometimes we believe we're in dialogue, but we don't realise that we are closed to others as other. We really want them to think our thoughts their way on some occasion. And so fruitful dialogue is when we are open to the authenticity of other people, of the other as other. We are called to ever new levels of trust, of faith and of courage. This has been witnessed to in our church. This has been witnessed to in all the various ways in which people try to live with faithfulness. Cardinal Kyrdine, one of the key uh, members of the council, called us to see, to judge and to act, to engage responsibly in our lives. And this is where we take on a mission and ministry spirituality. It's taken various shapes since Cardinal Cardine's recommendation and various people see, judge and act in life according to their own community, faith, upbringing. We're offered other ways of understanding. We're offered in Ignatian spirituality and many people are following that these days. The effort to find God in all things, to pay attention to what is happening in our own lives, in a, our communities and in the global as well as the local community. 
So how do we choose to act lovingly on behalf of, on behalf of and in response to God's reign, both now and not yet? God's covenant of love with all people and creation. Francis of Assisi came and has been a key person in our lives and in the life of the church and one for today in so far as he reminds us of the importance of being connected with creation. Our presence to creation, our sensitivities that there may be a future. Finally, Cardinal Martini, who just died recently, was a powerful voice during Vatican II. He was a man who could have been Pope, and he gave the, an interview just before his death. When asked, what do you recommend against the exhaustion of the church? His response was, we need conversion, we need transformation. He said Vatican II gave the Bible back to Catholics. We need to continue to reflect on, to pray the scriptures, to live the gospel life. We need faith, we need trust, we need courage. I am old and sick, he said, but good people around me make me feel their love. This love is stronger than the sentiment of distrust a distrust that I feel now, every now and then with regards to the church in Europe. Only love defeats exhaustion. God is love. And Cardinal Martini concludes with a question. Now I have a question for you. What can you do for the church? Thank you.